While you listen to this show, nerve cells in your brain are busy processing the sound information and helping you to make sense of my dulcet tones. One big mystery in the world of hearing research, though, has been how we perceive repeated sounds that hit our ears slowly, like the tapping of a woodpecker on a tree, compared to much faster noises that seem to blend into a continuous tone. UCL's Daniel Bendor has been investigating how the cells in our brains manage to distinguish these two different types of sound, and he hopes his findings could lead to the development of better deaf aids. Katani went to hear what he had to say. If you listen to a woodpecker, each peck the woodpecker makes, um, you hear a discrete sound that's produced. Um, But if the woodpecker was able to peck at a rate of 50 or 60 times per second, you wouldn't hear individual pecks. Instead, you'd hear a buzzing sound that has a pitch. So we have a really nice example of that here. Tell me about these sounds that we're going to listen to. So the sound that you're hearing that is uh, presented at at a rate of five times per second, and then it goes to 10 times per second, then 20, then 40, then 80, then 160, then 320. So it's basically doubling every time you hear the next sound. And at the very slow rate, you hear individual pulses. But by the end, at the fastest rate, you just hear a buzzing sound with a high pitch. And you can hear a transition at roughly the fourth sound when it's 40 times per second, where it's a little bit discreet, it's a little bit continuous. There's some perceptual amb- ambiguity. What's going on there when it switches from this kind of tap, tap, tap to buzz? How are you trying to unpick what's going on in the brain? The area I'm, I'm interested in is auditory cortex, a sort of uh, auditory hub for hearing sounds in, in your brain. And there you find neurons that can uh, lock their electrical activity onto each pulse when the rate is very slow. This is called the temporal code because the timing of when they respond is telling the rest of the brain what the sound is. But when the rate gets much faster, they can't lock on anymore. It's just going too fast. Yeah, they lose their temporal fidelity and they actually shut off. And another type of code takes over. And here it's not when the the electrical impulse happens, it's how many impulses are produced. It's basically two different ways of perceiving the sound. So some brain cells are perceiving these separate sounds. And then when they can't do it anymore, the other cells kick in and say, okay, it's just a noise. That's right, that there's sort of two, two languages the brain can use that is able to describe a larger set of sounds that, uh, that a single, than a single language could use. So we call these neural codes. And the, the question I was after in this particular um, article was understanding what is happening inside the cell that allows these codes to be produced. Um, sort of the, the mechanism inside the cell that can produce a rate code versus a temporal code. Tell me about how you go about investigating that and finding out the difference, the, the switch between this kind of this time code versus just the noise code. Yeah, so we can, we can start off with a computational model of a neuron. Um, we understand what causes a neuron to get excited, to produce activity, and also get inhibited. It's much like the accelerator on your car versus the brakes that speed up or slow down. And so in this model, you can uh, play around with the acceleration and the brakes, the excitation and inhibition. And it turns out that if you use the right combination of excitation and inhibition, you can create a rate code or a temporal code, depending on the, right, the, the combination that you use. So it's basically adjusting the firing of these nerve cells will, will tell you whether they can hear the taps or they just hear the noise. Right, right, exactly. And the, the implications of this is if you can control the language that brain cells use, it gives you more flexibility if you want to artificially create a percept, like if you have a cortical implant. If someone is deaf and you want to uh, artificially create a percept of a particular sound, you now have more flexibility in what kind of sounds you can generate if you can control the language that is generated. So if you're trying to help someone hear better, you know what makes them hear separate noises than what makes them hear just uh, continuous tones. That's, that's the hope, that this then can be extended to, to do those things. What can you do with this now? Where does this go now? So I think, I think the next step um, is to see if we can change these neural codes uh, in a real system. So we have a technique called optogenetics where using light you can excite neurons and you can inhibit neurons. Um, the same things that we're manipulating in the model. 
So the question is, if we take a regular auditory neuron and we manipulate the excitation and inhibition artificially using optogenetics, can we, in a real system, change the neural codes between temporal and rate? And if we can, this is really the basis for a next generation uh, cortical prosthetic that can more accurately represent the percepts that we normally hear. So basically we're talking about manipulating nerve cells in the brain as a way to enable deaf people to hear in this way. Right, but, but, but manipulating it in a way that more accurately mirrors what would happen in a normal hearing case.